Welcome to Gods and Heroes of Ancient Greece. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we will begin the tale of Meliasure and the Boar. Aeneas, king of Caledon, brought the first fruits of a lavish harvest season as an offering to the gods. Grain to Demeter, wine to Dionysus, oil to Athene, and to each deity the proper gift. Only Artemis was forgotten, and no fumes of incense rose at her altar. This angered the goddess, and she resolved to take revenge on him who had neglected her. She set a great boar on the king's domains. His red eyes darted fire. His neck bristled. Lightning seemed to dart from his foaming jaws, and his tusks were those of an elephant. This huge beast trampled the meadows and fields so that barns and lofts gaped empty of the promised crops. He devoured the grapevines, clusters and leaves, and ate the branches along with the olives. Neither shepherds nor their dogs were able to defend the flocks against the monster, nor the most savage bulls their herds. At last... The king's fair, Malaysia, assembled hunters and hounds to slay this wild boar. The most famous heroes of all Greece were invited to join in the chase, and with them Atlanta of Arcadia, the warlike daughter of Aesis. She had been abandoned in a forest and suckled by a bear. Later, huntsmen had found her and reared her. She had grown into a beautiful maiden, but she despised men and spent her days hunting in the forest. Not only had she rejected all men who approached her, but she even shot two centaurs who persisted in their swoot. Now, it was love of the chase that lured her into the company of these heroes. Her hair was caught in a simple knot her ivory quiver slung across her shoulder, and in her left hand she carried her bow. Her face looked girlish for a boy, and boyish for a girl. When Malaysia saw how fair she was, he said to himself, Happy the man she will consider worthy to be her husband. But he had not time to pursue that train of thought, for the dangerous hut allowed no delay. The group of hunters walked toward a wood of ancient trees which covered the level countryside and the slope of the mountain. When they arrived, some went about setting snares, while others unleashed hounds, and still others followed the tracks of the quarry. Presently, they came to a steep and narrow valley carved out by swollen streams. This gorge thick with reeds, swamp grass, and oysters, was the boar's hiding place. Now that the hounds had roused him, he broke through the wood like lightning speed from a cloud and charged into the very midst of his foes. The youths cried aloud and pointed their spears, but the boar evaded them and crashed through the pack. Missile after missile flew at him, only to graze his hide and increase his fury. With flashing eyes and heaving breast, he turned, made for the right flank of the hunters, like a stone shot from a sling, and the boar three of them to the ground, killing them instantly. A fourth, Nestor, destined to become a great hero in times to come, saved himself by climbing into the branches of an oak tree, on whose trunk the boar sharpened his terrible tusks. And here, the twin brothers, Castor and Polydeuces, charging on snow-white horses, would have pierced him with their spears had he not fled into impenetrable thickets. Then, Atlanta fitted an arrow to her string and shot at the monster through the bushes. It struck him under the ear. And now, at last, his bristles were stained with blood. 
Malaysia was the first to see the wound, and jubilantly he pointed it out to his comrades. Atlanta, he cried, it is you who deserves the prize of valor. At this, the men felt ashamed to think that a woman was cheating them of victory, and all threw their spears at once. But the very shower of their missiles prevented a single one of them from reaching the animal. Now, Ancius the Arcadian proudly raised his two-edged battle axe in both hands and made ready to deal the blow. But before it fell, the boar drove his tusks into the hero's side and laid bare his entrails so that he died in a pool of blood. Then Jason cast his spear, but it missed the mark and glanced sidewise into the body of Celadon. Finally, Malaysia hurled two spears, one after the other. The first fell to the ground, but the second pierced the boar in the middle of the back. The beast began to rage and run in circles. Malaysia dealt with a fresh blow on the neck, and how lances struck him from all sides. The dying boar lay stretched on the earth and writhed in blood, pouring from his wounds. Malaysia pressed his foot against his head and with his sword ripped the rough hide from the beast and presented it to the brave Atlanta, along with the head and the gleaming tusks. Take these trophies, he said. They are mine by right, but you shall share in the glory. But the hunters were angry that such honor should be accorded a woman, and murmur ran through their ranks. The brothers of Malaysia's mother and the sons of Thestus clinched their fists and shook them at Atlanta and threatened her with loud words. Put down those trophies at once, woman, they cried. Do you think you can trick us with what is ours? Your beauty will aid you just as little as Malaysia, that lovesick waster of these gifts. With that, he, they took the head and hide from her, disputing Malaysia's right to dispose of them. And at this, he was overcome with rage, ground his teeth, and roared, You who would rob the deserts of another, let me teach you how threats differ from deeds. And before his uncles knew what he was about, he had plunged his sword first into one and then into the other. Althea, Malaysia's mother, was on her way to the temple of the gods to offer thanks for her son's victory when the bodies of her brothers were carried by. She beat her breast in anguish, hastened back to the palace, changed her golden robes of rejoicement for black of mourning, and filled the city with lament. But when she heard that the murderer was her own son, Malaysia, she dried her tears. Her sorrow changed to the lust to kill, and she suddenly remembered something she had long since forgotten. When Malaysia had been but a few days old, the fates had appeared at her mother's bedside. Your son will become a great hero, the first foretold. Your son will be a great man. Prophesied the second, your son, concluded the third, will live until that brand on the hearth is consumed by fire. Hardly had the fates vanished when Althea took the brand from the hearth, quenched it in fire, and full of solicitude for the life of her son, hid it in a secret chamber. Now, in her vengeful anger, she thought of the brand and hurried to the place where she had locked it away. She had kindling and wood brought, and when the flames leapt high, seized the brand she had taken from its hiding place, put it in her heart. The mother struggled with the sister. Her face grew pale and then flushed. Four times she reached forward to place the brand in the fire, and four times she drew back her hand. In the end, her sisterly love overcame her. 
Turn your eyes upon me, she said. Look at me, goddess of vengeance. Look at this offering to the Furies. And you sprites and for my brother, so recently fled from the body, know what I am doing for your sake. Accept the hapless fruit of my own body as your burial gift. <laughs> so dearly bought. My heart is breaking with mother love, and soon I shall follow him whose life I am taking for your sake. So she spoke, and turning away her gaze, threw the brand into the fire with shaking fingers. Melanger, in the meantime, had returned to the city, brooding with mingled emotions on his triumph, his love and his crime. Suddenly, he felt his innermost being burn with fever, and he threw himself on his couch in an agony of pain. He bore it like a hero, but grieved to die an inglorious death far from the battlefield, and envied his comrades who had perished from the thrusts of the boar. Moaning, he called for his brothers, his sisters, his aged father, and his mother, who was still standing at the hearth, watching with stony gaze while the fire consumed the brand. Her son's pains waxed with the flames, but when they wanted and nothing was left but pale ash, his suffering grew less, and at the last spark he breathed his last breath, and the spirit left his body, his father, his sisters, and all Caledon mourned at his buyer, but his mother was absent. They found her strangled in a noose, stretched at the very hearth which held the brittle cinders. Tantalus. Tantalus, son of Zeus, ruled over Cyphus in Lydia was very rich in worldly goods and famed for his wealth in both Asia and Greece. If ever the Olympian gods paid honor to the mortal, it was to him. Because of his divine origin, they cherished him as a friend, and at last he was even permitted to dine at the board of Zeus and listen to the words which passed between the immortals. But his vain human spirit could not bear the exquisite burden of an unearthly bliss, and he began to sin against the gods in numerous ways. He betrayed their secrets. He filched nectar and ambrosia from their board and distributed among the companions in the world below. He hid the image of a dog wrought in precious gold, which another had stolen from Zeus's temple in Crete, and when the god demanded it back, he swore he'd never seen it. Finally, in his matchless arrogance, he invited the gods to his palace as a return for their hospitality. And in order to test whether they really knew all things, he had his own son, Pelops, slain and prepared for their meal. Only Demeter ate of the gruesome dish one shoulder blade. The other gods recognized what had been put before them and threw the torn limbs of the boy into a cauldron from which Clotho, one of the fates, drew him forth in fresh beauty. But one shoulder was made of ivory. With this, Tantalus had exceeded all bounds of iniquity, and the gods thrust him down to Hades, where he was punished with cruel torments. He had to stand in the middle of a lake whose waters came to his chin, yet he suffered burning thirst, for he could not reach the draught so close to his lips. Whenever he bent down to quench his thirst, the water receded, and his feet lay the dark, dry earth. At the same time, he had to endure the pangs of hunger. Behind him on the margin of the lake grew beautiful fruit trees which arched their boughs over his heads. Looking up, he saw juicy pears, red-cheeked apples, glowing pomegranates, plump figs, and green olives. But the moment 
He reached to pluck them. A strong wind whipped the branches up into the clouds. His last and most terrible torment was the incessant fear of death. A great block of stone hung in the air over his head and constantly threatened to crush him. So imperious Tantalus, who scorned the gods, was destined to threefold perpetual suffering in the underworld. And here I end my tale for today. But I'll be back tomorrow with more tales. Many more tales. Until then, my friends, may you enjoy the journey.